Hey guys, welcome back to Rapture Alerts. My name is Sean. If you're just tuning in, this is just a guy talking about Jesus. That's all I do over here. And I'm watching and waiting for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to take us home in a pre-tribulation rapture. I hope you're happy, healthy, and well, and that you have what you need. So guys, for today's message, let's take a look at the thief up on Calvary on the cross with Jesus. I believe there's some things that we can take away from that story and learn from. Did you know that there's only one character in the Gospels that demonstrated full belief in Jesus. And that was the thief, believe it or not. Not the disciples, because remember, they doubted. They doubted from time to time. The Lord had to remind them that there's nothing to fear and to put all of their trust in him. So let's take a look at that today. We'll read the scripture, and then we'll take a look at the uh, commentary that I've got, and we'll hang out and have a great time. Let's open up a prayer, and let's give him thanks. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for this channel and allowing me to be in here today. Father, thank you for what you're doing right now. I put all my trust and hope and faith in you, and I ask that you please lift every single viewer up and bless them, Father. Please take their pain away, and please wrap your wings around them today and remind them that you are there and that you are on the way to take us home, Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, let's go ahead and get started. Let's take a look at what I've got pulled up here for us. This is Luke 23, 39 through 43. So Jesus is on the cross on Calvary. We're talking about the crucifixion here, but there's two other people up there with him, two thieves, right? There's only going to be one that we're concerned with today. Listen to this if you've never heard this. And one of the malefactors that which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. How awesome is that? Um, if you have never heard that or you're not saved, I'll give you the gospel right here. There was a man that died for your sins. His name is Jesus Christ. They hung him on a cross up on Calvary. Once they killed him, they put him in the tomb. And three days later, he rose again and came back to life. You have to believe that in order to be saved. And you have to ask Jesus to come into your heart and save you. Cleanse you of your sins. You have to repent turn away from that old lifestyle and believe if you do that jesus said that he will save you and you can go where he went which is heaven but there's only one way there john 14 6 says i'm the way the truth and the life no other man coming to the father except by me you have to believe that in order to be saved so really look at what it is we're talking about this is god jesus is god he's god incarnate right took himself apart put himself in a human body and that's his son. So they are the same person, but they are different, right? They're separate, if that makes sense. The master of the universe is hanging on a cross, dying after being beaten, mocked, scorned, rocks thrown at him, made fun of, laughed at, spit on, everything. Gigantic crown of thorns slammed down on his head. And he's hanging up here with these criminals. But isn't it interesting what one of the criminals is saying to him? All right, guys, so let's go ahead and jump over here and take a look at what I've got pulled up for us as a resource today. It's called the Christology of the Thief. It's off the Grace to You website, and this is from April of 2018. Let's take a look at it together. I hope you enjoy this. Christology is an inexhaustible subject. Concerning his incarnation alone, the Apostle John said, There are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the word itself would not contain the books that would be written. That's John 21, 25. We cannot know everything about Christ, but we can know everything we need to know in order to receive his mercy and inherit eternal life. And for that, we don't need to study systematic theology or evangelistic methodology. The answers come from a criminal during a brief cameo in the Gospel of Luke. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, 
but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Isn't that awesome? That's Luke 23, 39 through 43. Five critical aspects of the Thies Christology are revealed in verses 41 and 42. Let's scroll down just a little bit here, guys. The thief declared Christ's righteousness. The thief knew crucifixion was deserved so far as he was concerned. He described his slow, torturous death as suffering justly and what he deserved for his deeds. That's Luke 23, 41. But concerning the man on the cross next to him, the thief declared that this man has done nothing wrong. Christ's perfect righteousness shone into the dark recesses of a man whose life was marked by wickedness, John MacArthur comments. The final evidence of the repentant thief's divinely transformed heart was his belief in Jesus Christ. The story of his transformation moves from an assessment of his sinful condition to an assessment of the Savior's character. When he said of him, this man has done nothing wrong, he was confessing not merely the Lord's innocence of any crime, but also his sinlessness. The Apostle Paul recognized the necessity of Christ's sinlessness in order for him to be our sin-bearing substitute. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that for us. Thank you for paying the ultimate price because I know I don't deserve it. Any of your grace and your mercy. Thank you so much, Father, for doing that for me. Let's scroll down a little bit and see. The thief appealed to Christ exclusively. It should not escape our notice that the thief never made his plea for mercy to the powers visibly present around him. At the foot of the cross stood representatives of Roman political power as well as members of Israel's religious elite. But the thief made no appeal to the Romans for exoneration, nor to the Jews for spiritual absolution. Mustering what little remained of his strength and consciousness, the thief made his only appeal to the crucified Savior. Amen. The exclusive, exclusivity, exclusivity, of Christ is an essential tenet of the Christian faith. Remember, the word tenet means a, a faith or belief or a doctrine. This word right here, if you're reading along, tenet, it's like a faith or belief or a doctrine. Jesus made it clear that he is the way, not a way, to heaven. That's John 14, 6. The apostles continued that message as they established the early church, stating that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. That's Acts 4.12. Christ grouped every other religion into one doomed category, and consequently his exclusive claims are offensive to many. But the thief in his most desperate hour knew Jesus was his only hope. Scroll down a little bit here. The thief requested Christ's forgiveness. The thief was not confused about his most desperate need. John MacArthur points out that the thief's request for Jesus to remember him was synonymous with a cry for pardon. Doesn't that sound like us crying out to the Lord? Abba, Abba, please save us. Please save my soul. All the things that we've read in Psalms. All of those cries for prayers, right? Isn't it interesting to see this person is up there hanging with Christ and even though the disciples doubted him, this person never did. And we're about to get to that part. I find that very, very interesting. That makes me want to step my faith game up. I mean, big time. Can you imagine hanging on the cross with Jesus? Looking at him suffering? I tend to believe or think that we would most certainly forget about our own pain. Looking at the true Messiah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, hanging up there suffering for us, bleeding crying out in pain to the Father. Thank you, Jesus. That's what I would say right there is thank you, Father, so much again for what you did. The thief requested Christ's forgiveness. The thief was not confused about his most desperate need. John MacArthur points out that the thief's request for Jesus to remember him was synonymous with a cry for pardon. He then addressed Jesus directly as the Savior and humbly asked him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This was nothing less than a plea for the forgiveness apart from which no one will enter God's kingdom. He based his request on Christ's prayer that God would forgive those who crucified him. 
which gave him hope that he too might receive forgiveness. He expressed belief that Jesus is the Savior, since he would not have asked for entrance to the kingdom unless he believed Jesus was willing and able to provide it. He was the plea of a broken, penitent, unworthy sinner for grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Sounds just like me. I don't know about you guys, but I, I definitely see myself right there. The thief's subjective feelings and painful circumstances were not the focus of his plea to Christ. Instead, he knew what his true and ultimate need was, forgiveness. The thief recognized Christ's authority. Implicit in the thief's plea for forgiveness was his recognition of Christ's authority to grant forgiveness and eternal life. The thief also knew who the real king was at Calvary since he ascribed God's kingdom as your kingdom. That's Luke 23, 42. He believed that Jesus was Israel's Messiah. He acknowledged that the Lord would one day establish his kingdom, which was promised in the covenants God made with Abraham and David and reiterated repeatedly to the prophets. The thief anticipated Christ's resurrection. The gospel narratives don't shy away from exposing the unbelief of Christ's closest disciples. All of them barring, John fled at his arrest and despaired of his death, even though Jesus taught them repeatedly that he would rise from the dead. There is only one character in the gospel narratives who demonstrates authentic belief in Christ's coming resurrection, and that's the thief. That's the part I was mentioning in the intro, guys. I find that very, very interesting right there because disciples are disciples, correct? And those were the ones that walked with Jesus. They called him teacher. And look at what that says right there. I, I never noticed that before. All right, guys, let's keep going right here. Even the casual reader of scripture can't help but be amazed at the thief's preoccupation with eternal matters. Rather than be overwhelmed with the doom of a Roman cross, he was able to unmistakably articulate his confidence that Christ would soon rise from the dead. Moreover, as John MacArthur explains, he based his own hope of personal resurrection on the reality of Christ's coming resurrection. Since no one survived crucifixion, he understood that Jesus would have to rise from the dead to do that. He probably knew that Jesus had the power over death since the news of his raising of Lazarus had spread throughout Jerusalem. He no doubt was aware that Daniel 12.2 promised that the saints would be raised and given a place of glory in the kingdom. His request was that Jesus would raise him and grant him entrance to that kingdom. Through the pain of the crucifixion, the thief was still able to declare Christ's righteousness, appeal to him exclusively, petition his forgiveness, recognize his authority, and anticipate his future resurrection. In all, the thief spoke six words about Christ and nine words to Christ. I never knew that either. I thought that part was pretty interesting, too. Those two brief statements reveal a man with an outstanding grasp of Christology. It finishes up right here by saying, There is a profound simplicity to the thief's faith in the Savior, and it is a glorious benchmark for every sinner who approaches Christ in repentance and faith. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that study and hanging out with me. I appreciate Ms. Diane Barr of requesting that message. I had a really good time with it. I learned a bunch of things that I didn't know. I hope that you did too. And if you had never heard that story, I hope you enjoyed it. And I definitely hope if you haven't accepted Jesus into your heart that you do believe the gospel and that you go by John 14, 6. That is the only way to salvation in heaven. Guys, the war is off the chain right now. I'm going to say right here at the end, there's not much time left. It doesn't matter if I don't know the the day or the time or the hour, we have to be on guard, we have to remain watchful, and we have to pray without ceasing. Do not give up hope. Do not give the enemy an inch. Don't back down. Reach out for prayer. Stay in the word and cry out to Jesus and no one and nothing else and watch what happens. He's not going to hurt you or harm you. He's going to save you and make a way for you to come through that fiery trial that you're going through. If the rapture isn't right now, a few moments from now, or even tonight, just do what we always say over here. You keep looking up and we'll see you up top.